Our text this morning comes from Acts chapter 13, as we continue to walk through this book together on Sunday mornings. And we find in our text today, Paul, Paul turns uh, from the, the core of his message to an invitation. And we're going to pick up on that invitation beginning in verse 38. Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 38. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and through him everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Therefore, take heed, so that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. Behold, you scoffers, and marvel and perish. For I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. Now when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. Well, what a blessing it is to gather here today and come under the Word of God and hear what the Lord has to say. Over the last few weeks, we've been walking through this book, uh, that's actually ch- this chapter of this book. We, we've been walking through the the book of Acts uh, for some time now, but we've been walking through chapter 13, and most specifically, we've been looking at the, the first, it's not, it's not the first message that Paul preached. He was preaching long before we get to Acts 13 in terms of this record, but it's the first recorded sermon that we have of the Apostle Paul. And he had gone with Barnabas, John Mark had been with them, but he had he had jumped ship, as it were. He, he, he jumped to a new ship and went back uh, to Antioch. And this is Pisidian Antioch. And as we noted, this is in Galatia. It's in um, Asia Minor. And so uh, we noted from Paul's introduction of his message about all the, the things that God is doing in history. God is not just sitting in his throne in heaven, waiting for everything just to, you know, finally get to a certain point where he's going to act. He is acting constantly. Every day, every moment, he is acting. And at, at the heart of what he's doing, and as we've noted many times, you know, the world history, at, at times it seems to be in utter chaos. It seems like uh, nobody's in charge and things is just going uh, out of control. We, we, we just witnessed this week um, the, 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 the great challenge in Maui and the Hawaiian Islands uh, with the, the fire and, and people. They, the only thing that they could do to escape the fire was, was to get in the water. They jumped in the ocean and they were being rescued by, uh, you know, um, you know, a variety of different types of ships and even, to, even, even in terms of military type ships and these kinds of things, the, the Coast Guard and and these kinds of things. And so, you know, we look at, sometimes we look at our politics and wonder, you know, who's running what and wh- who's running it into the ground or, or whatever. We have all these different uh, opinions and positions on this. And then we, we hear about, you know, years ago, um, like uh, rulers, totalitarian ruler like uh, Saddam Hussein, who, who was not only, you know, contrary to other nations and wanted to, you know, wipe off, you know, different nations off the face of the earth, but he had no problem destroying his own people, putting his own people to death. And so we we see all this, and we think, you know, there's just no rhyme or reason. Nobody's in control. But what the Bible reveals to us from Genesis to Revelation is God is in control. Now, he's not He's not responsible for your actions and my actions with regards to our sinful actions and these kinds of things. And yet, for instance, we look back at the, uh, the, the brother Joseph of uh, the sons of Israel who, who was sold. At first, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to put him to death. But then 
you know, one brother said, no, we can't kill our flesh and blood. And, and so he's advocating for Joseph. And, and so they, they just throw him in a pit. So we're just going to leave him in this pit like a, an old well and move on. Because they, they hated him. They were jealous of him. He, he was the favorite of the, of the father. He had a, a multicolored uh, blanket that his dad or a robe that his dad made for him and the, all these kinds of things. And he had these visions that one day he, even his own siblings and his family would be bowing down before him. And so they just thought he was a nutball and they didn't want anything to do with him. And they hated him so much they wanted to kill him. But they, they, they threw him into the pit, but then they saw a caravan of... Uh, of, uh, you know, we have Isaac and, and then uh, we have uh, Ishmael, uh, the, the sons of Abraham. And Ishmael was uh, the, the son of uh, the, the, the handmaid Hagar. And so we, we see Ishmaelites now at that time in history. They're coming along and they, they purchase Joseph as a slave. In other words, his brother sold him into slavery. And so the whole long story of Joseph's life uh, in Egypt, he sold to Potiphar's house in, in Egypt, and, and then, you know, he's, he's accused of something he didn't do, that is, with Potiphar's wife, who was trying to make the moves on him, and he would have nothing to do with it, and yet she said, oh, he's making the moves on me, so he was thrown into to prison. And so this goes from bad to worse, and, you know... God is, is like, where's God in all of this? And yet God enabled Joseph to, to uh, understand visions and dreams, which was the, the, the catalyst that would come along to where Pharaoh had, um, you know, these things that were on his mind that needed to, uh, to be thought through and, and understood and say, hey, there's this guy in prison. And so they bring him out and he's able to, you know, receive the vision that, that God was given to Pharaoh and to ex explain it, but also explain what they need to do because it was talking about a famine coming and, and all these kinds of things. And so Joseph was able to tell Pharaoh, this is exactly what we need to do. And it not only saved the Egyptian people, but it, it saved other nations and it saved Israel. That is, Israel and his sons, Jacob and his sons. Now, I, this was not part of my introduction, but I, I'm, I just want to get to the heart of this, that we, we find that even in those circumstances, and we find it in Genesis chapter 50, um, when uh, Joseph, after their dad dies, you know, Jacob or Israel dies, all the brothers are concerned, oh, now that dad's gone, you know, Joseph's going to come against us, because he's like second in command of Egypt. And so they're like, you know, coming before him, and he said, I, I love you guys. I, I'm not going to do anything against you. And he explained that what, what you did for evil, what was the intention of, of evil in your hearts, God has used for good. And it not only saved nations, but it saved the people of Israel. And you know what? God said, Centuries earlier, with regards to uh, Genesis chapter 15, he said to Abraham that he was going to raise up his nation of people and that he was going to raise them up. And for a period of time, they were going to go into another nation and they would become slaves. This is how they ended up in Egypt. God foretold it. He, he didn't just foresee it. He foretold it. In other words, God is in control of world history. And everything is unfolding according to his purposes and his plans. And at the heart of that is what Paul is preaching in this message, as we've been noting. He is preaching um, that salvation has come to Israel. And it has come by means of Jesus Christ. Now, as, as we think about God acting in history, there are 16 times in this particular message, and we've already been through the message. This morning we come to the conclusion of the message. But in the heart of the message, 16 times, uh, God reveals what He is doing, not only in the life of Israel, but in the life of, Is of, 
of the world to bring about his Savior, Jesus Christ. And John Piper, he just he does a summary of these 16 statements. I, I just want to highlight them so we can know where we were and why we're at this point in terms of Jesus is the Savior. Number one, verse 17, the first part of 17, it is God who chooses Israel from all the people of the earth for his special purposes. And a lot of this, Israel, you know, these Jews at the, the synagogue in Pisidian Antioch, and the God-fearers. The God-fearers are Gentiles who have most likely converted to Judaism or are converting to Judaism. And so these are Jews. And so when you're hearing this, that God, choo- God chooses Israel, you know, there, there's probably people in the crowd going, amen to that, whatever they say in Hebrew or, or Aramaic or Greek in those days. Uh, So secondly, in verse 17, God made the people great during their stay in Egypt. In other words, they had to get to Egypt. That's what we were talking about, the Joseph portion. And then while they were there, there's about 70 to 80, 90 people that came into Egypt at that time to be saved during the famine, and a million plus people left Egypt when they would come out. I mean, they were just multiplying, and God was blessing them. 3, verse 17, says it says, God led them out of Egypt with an uplifted arm. In other words, God promised that he would bring them out of Egypt, and he brought them out of slavery, and he did, and that's in Exodus. 4, verse 18, God bore with Israel in the wilderness. Or another old reading with one letter different says that God carried Israel like a father carries a child. And I, I would lean more towards the fact that God bore with Israel. In other words, he put up with them. Just like, you know, at times when we were growing up, our parents would put up with us. Um, and yet, you know, this is, you know, God, did never, he never left them. He brought them up even when they were, you know, complaining and they were being disobedient, rejecting God in the wilderness experience. We, even when they came to the promised land. And they said, oh, we can't go in there. You know, that's why they would spend another 40 years in the wilderness. Five, verse 19, it was God who destroyed the seven nations in the land of Canaan so that they could inhabit this, the, the, the land of Canaan. Again, we're just doing snapshots of the history of God's people here. Six, verse 19, it was God who gave Israel the land of Canaan as an inheritance. Seven, in verse 20, it was God who gave the judges. And again, that's like, um, you know, um, um, oh, his name is, it looted me, uh, Samson. You know Samson uh, who, who killed all these uh, Philistines with the, the jawbone of a donkey. I mean, he was a judge. And there were many, there were 12 judges that we find in the book of Judges that God raised up to deliver his people. Eight, uh, in verse 21. It was God who gave Israel her first king, and that was Saul. And then it didn't go so well. Saul turned out to be um, exactly what God knew he would become, uh, a terrible king. Nine, in verse 22, it was God who removed Saul, just like Daniel says in Daniel 2.21, God changes times and seasons, and he removes kings and sets up, sets up kings. Or as God says in Daniel 4.32, the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. So God removes Saul. But when he removes Saul, who did he replace him with? 10, verse 22, God raised up David, the son of Jesse. And David became one of the most beloved kings of Israel. 11, verse 23, it was God who brought to Israel a Savior Jesus, and he connects Jesus to David and the Messianic promise. That is, that from the covenant that God makes with David, he says that a Savior is going to come from him. A king who will reign forever is going to come from from David, from his seed. And that's what we find. We we find that in Matthew chapter 1 in terms of the genealogical record you go back, you, you look at your own genealogy, um, and, and you look back as far as you can go back to see where did we come from? What part of this world did our people come from? 
Well, Jesus, his genealogical record goes all the way back to Abraham, then on to David, and then on to uh, Joseph, who was married, uh, to Mary, who was the mother of Jesus. And so that's how we make that connection. And it's, it's like he leaps from the king, the, the kingship of David to the arrival of Jesus. And there's a lot that happened in world history between that time period. But he is saying that this Savior, just like I promised, is going to come from the seed of David. And he did. 12, verse 24 and 25, we meet John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, he came as the final prophet, as it were, to make straight the coming, the way of the coming of the Lord. And that is, he was the final prophet that would be pointing to the very in person, alive, on this earth, Messiah, which is Jesus the Christ. And remember, uh, John was the one that baptized him. And he knew when he baptized him that this is the one because the Holy Spirit came descending. God spoke from heaven. The Holy Spirit comes down descending. And, and John even says in John chapter 1 that, um, you know, the, the one who sent me, which is God, told me that the one that I saw, the, the Spirit descending upon, uh, that was the one, that he is the Son of God. And I saw it. He testifies that he saw it. 12 or 13, verse 26, when Paul says, To us has been sent the message of this salvation. Who sent this message? Who sent the message to us? That is to Paul and the Jews and the God fearers and us Gentiles. Who did that? God did. God sent this message of salvation. And this message of salvation is the fact that, that in Jesus Christ, He sent His only begotten Son. He died on a cross. And He, he didn't die for His sins because He never sinned. He died for your sins and He died for my sins. For those who would believe. 14. He goes on to say in verse 27, Paul goes out of his way to show that even those who did not know God who were out of step with God and could not understand His Word, nevertheless did, did what God planned and prophesied. In other words, he starts to go down through all these prophetic words from the Old Testament prophecies and how they came to fruition. And we spent our, our, the balance of our time last week walking through prophecy after prophecy after prophecy fulfilled, fulfilled, fulfilled in Jesus. Now, I just found out this week yeah, you know, I, I, I reference Isaiah 53 quite a bit, um, and it, it's, it's about the suffering servant. And as you read Isaiah writing centuries before the coming of Christ, centuries before he went to the cross and died for our sins, uh, Isaiah writes an account of it as if he was standing there watching it in person. And I just found out this week, I never knew this. But when the Jews gather together in terms of their synagogue and they have their Old Testament readings, they, they go from Isaiah 52 to Isaiah 54. They will not read Isaiah 53. And that's talking about the suffering servant. You can't skip that part. Because when you start listening to it, you're like, well, it sounds a whole lot like what happened to Jesus. It did. Because that's, that was ordained by God. It was spoken of God before it ever happened. 15. In verse 29, Paul makes the same point. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. So what was happening in the arrest? and the trial, and the death, and the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus was God's plan. And he wrote about that in the Old Testament Scriptures. Finally, 16 and verse 30, it is God who raises Jesus from the dead. So God has been at work from the very beginning. And not only in, 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 in sending His Son to die, but raising him up again to reign forever. So these are the promises. Paul has, 
his look back at the history of Israel, and again, all the history of Israel is, amen, 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 amen. But then he connects Jesus to David. It's like, wait a second. I don't know about this. Probably gets quiet in the synagogue. He mentioned Jesus. He's not a part of this. But he was. He's the culmination of all of that. And instead of saying, so I just want you to know that Jesus is the Savior because I say so. No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. He says Jesus is the Savior because God says so. And he goes back and, as I said, prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. I, I'm sure that as they were listening, sometimes when you have somebody explain something so clearly, something that's always been there, it was written there. But he's just was breaking those prophecies off one after the other and showing how they're fulfilled in Christ. That, that's why in our text this morning, we see a response from people who are like begging, begging Paul and Barnabas, please, can you talk about this more next Sabbath? And some of them, they didn't want to wait till the next Sabbath. They were following after Paul and continuing with them. And so what we find at the, at the end of this message, Paul brings the message to a close with an invitation. It's, it's one thing to talk about Jesus. And say, okay, yeah, I know Jesus is out there. It's another thing to believe and to follow him. And that's what he's calling them to do. We have the invitation of God. And that invitation is repent and turn to my son. Put your faith in my son, Jesus. That's the invitation. And for those who are like, yeah, I don't know about this. Uh, I, I'm not, not really into this. There's a warning. He reveals the warning of God from an Old Testament prophet. And it just happens to be my favorite prophet, my, my favorite minor prophet in the Old Testament, and it's Habakkuk. And as, as my, my uh, faculty supervisor with my doctoral program always used to call him Habakkuk. <laughs> I guess that's how you say it in Hebrew. Uh, you know, I've always, always said it as Habakkuk, but Habakkuk, same guy. And he gives us a warning from, from Habakkuk. And then at the end, there are some who are following, and, and Paul that tells them to continue in the grace of God. And from that, we, we can infer that some of these people must have believed because the only way they could continue in the grace of God is if they had believed in the grace of God. And so we begin there with the invitation this morning. The invitation says, Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him, that's Jesus, Forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Now, I want you to know throughout the text, throughout his sermon, all of his references are us, 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 us. Because he's a Jew. Paul's, uh, he's a Jew from his birth. So as he's talking about their history, he's talking about his history. So it's us, 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 all the way through uh, the, the, the Jewish history and also the Jewish prophecy that we find in the Old Testament Scriptures. But now this is the first time we see him change the pronoun to you because it is specific to those who have yet to believe in Jesus. The invitation is for you. And even though it's in the plural... You, it's all those people that are gathered at that synagogue on that day, but it's also a recognition of that that message is for you. For each and every one of you. That's how specific God is. That God brings you 
to a place that you had no expectation you would ever be there. But he brought you here, for instance, today. Here we are in this wonderful room, enjoying some time together singing songs and lifting up the name of the Lord. And yet now the Lord, through his word and through his songs and through the reading of scriptures, the preaching of his word, he's speaking. That we even have the privilege of being somewhere where you're actually hearing the word of God proclaimed is astounding. I'm not saying it's like, oh, well, you know, uh, you should be thankful I'm up here preaching the Bible today. It's astounding that there are preachers around this world that in a town like Williamstown or in a village in some remote part of Africa or Indonesia, I've been to Guatemalan mountains, and I've, I've been to some ro- remote, remote, remote. I, I went to one place where I had to preach in English. The next guy, he preached in Spanish, and uh, he, you know, he's preaching for me from English to Spanish, and then in an Indian dialect, the third guy preached. So three of us were preaching the same message. Can you imagine my message? If we, we, we took my whole message on a Sunday morning, that, that would take like three hours to get through. For, to go through the translation. It was amazing to be there. It was just a, like wooden, I mean like tree, tree trunks that they had cut down and dug them down into the ground and they, they put like a small little roof over top of that and I mean it was packed to the gills. And they don't know me. They have no idea who I am. They've never met me before. And who, who in the world I ever thought that I would ever be standing on that soil in that moment with those people? Some of them are wearing definitely, I mean, some are in their Indian native clothing. That's, that's, they're still wearing this old native type clothing. But many people, uh, it's like, you know, the, in, in some parts of their village, the goodwill broke out. And they're wearing like a, a T-shirt with a Nike symbol on it. Whether they know what that means or not, but they, you know, somebody came to that village with clothing from the United States to, to give to that, that village. And it was in that village I got to share the gospel with people who are complete strangers to me. That's how God works. And he brings the word of God to you, pre- preaches it to you. That's what he's saying. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed, preached to you. And he's calling his fellow Jews and God fears to repent. Well, pastor, I'm looking at the text. I, I don't know if you're looking at the same text I'm looking at, but I, I, don't, I don't see the word repent there. Well, it's in the invitation. It's in the statement that Forgiveness of sins through him is proclaimed to you. You must turn from your sins. And what does it mean to turn from your sins? Repent. Repent. And again, let it be known to you, this is a personal invitation. That through Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins, it's like, well, I don't know. I don't know if I, I sin. I, I think I'm a pretty good guy. I, I could have never said that, even from my childhood. <laughs> I was not a good guy. I was always trying to do everything my parents told me not to do. In case there's any question in your mind, the Bible reveals to us whether we're sinners or not. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, so I'm a sinner. So big deal. Well, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. It is a big deal. That the, the wage that I receive is a punishment of death. And yet, Forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you 
through this raised and living Jesus who died. He died for your sins. And it's the fact that He rose, that God raised Jesus up from the dead, that He will no longer return to decay. He, he didn't decay. Dead bodies decay. It doesn't take long. All you have to do is, is watch some of the creatures that, you know, find their demise on the road and how quickly a deer or a gopher or what have you, a little squirrel. I mean, it's just, just like that. The decay is, is immediate. And yet he did not decay as promised through the Scriptures. And to those who believe in him, it says here in Acts 13, 34 that we've already been through, I will give you the holy and surely ble sure blessings of David. In other words, uh, you know, the blessing of David, the, the covenant of David is a kingdom covenant. And it comes with a king and it comes with citizens. And the king is Jesus. And he will sit on that throne for eternity and his citizens are those who believe and put their faith in Jesus. We see in, in Psalm 16, verse 10, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One, and your, the, the word for Holy One is the Messiah, which is Jesus. We see there in Romans 3.24 that if you turn to Jesus, who is the one who brings forgiveness of sins, uh, we are justified. In other words, we are made right with God. And we see in Romans 3.24, being justified as a gift by His grace. There's that theme of our singing this morning in our Scriptures. And we have been justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Over and over again, you know, the grace of God, the sending of Jesus, forgiveness through Him, justification through Him, reconciliation through Him. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. No man, not one man, not one woman is going to come before God and live with Him for eternity apart from from going through Christ. That's it. Again, I, I talk about this all the time. You, you, you see people on their Facebook posting, a celebrity dies. And they just, they write R.I.P., which means rest in peace. May he rest in peace. May she rest in peace. The only way any of us are going to rest in peace is to rest in Christ. Apart from that, there is no rest and peace. And I want you to know, brothers and sisters, as Romans 6.23, this is a free gift. This is the free gift of God, and it is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He goes on to say in verse 39, that through Jesus, everyone who believed believes is freed from all things. Now, that sounds pretty generic. That's pretty general. Can, can you, like, specify? What do I mean, what are all things? What is it that I'm being freed from? Well, the, the key things that the Bible reveals that you and I are being freed from are one is, is our sins. And then the penalty for our sins is death. So we're being freed from our sins and from death, even though... We're going to die physically. Most of us will die physically unless the Lord returns. There are some going to be alive when Jesus returns. Some believers are going to be alive. But many of us will have passed away. And in the Bible, we, we see it over and over again, especially in the New Testament. Every time you hear about somebody dying, they just say they are asleep. In other words, their body, but their soul is immediately, to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. So our soul automatically, instantaneously, from death goes directly to be with Jesus. And these sleeping bodies, these resting bodies in the grave, when Jesus comes again, 
He's going to raise up those bodies and we're going to have the same body as his. It's going to be an eternal body. First Corinthians 15. We don't have time to go through it. Read that whole chapter and you'll see it. It's just richly uh, in, in, in giving all those truths about what it means to, to be uh, alive in Christ with our physical bodies, even though our soul is already, it, it does not die at death. So through, every, through Jesus, everyone who believes is freed from all things. Now, Paul, would, he would specify in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, he says, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, you know, that, that means when you were not a believer, when you were not at, at that time in your life saved, he says, he, that is God, made you alive together with him, that is Jesus. He made you alive together with Jesus. That's what we were sharing about, you know, when we were doing uh, Corey and Heather's baptism this morning. You know, in terms of faith, we were dead in our trespasses and sin. And it's God who intervenes. And He made us alive together with Christ. It's, it's an act of creation. That's why He calls us a new creation or the new man. And when he goes on to say this, he said, he made you alive together with him. You used to be in your transgressions and following your flesh, but he made you al alive together with him, ha having forgiven us all our transgressions, all our sins. All our sins have been forgiven, brothers and sisters. And Christ, he, re he redeemed us from the curse of the law. And then the curse of the law, again, you'll know if, if you ever head down the road too fast. And I, I remember in high school, um, we, we just had graduated, actually, and Sherry and I, were, we were going on a big senior trip to Kings Island. That was our senior trip. And we were going with uh, my brother and our best friend, Brian, and they were driving in one car, and Sherry and I were driving another car. I, I, I think it was just because I was in love with my future wife that I just wanted to drive by myself with her to Kings Island. And so we're driving down the road, and I come behind uh, a couple tractor trailers, and the one tractor trailer is in the other, you know, the passing lane, and he finally gets on through. And so there's uh, some cars coming by, and they were really coming up fast. So I gunned it. And got around, and I sped right on across, um, you know, right past that one tractor trailer, and then the next tractor trailer, and I got on the other side of that, and there's a state trooper in Ohio sitting in a median. And I was not going the speed limit. I had the pedal to the metal. And you know what? He wanted to have a chat with me. And I, uh, back in those days, um, I don't know if it was because I was, 17, going on 18, or what have you, um, they, they took your driver's license in Ohio. So he took my driver's license, and, and he gave me a ticket, and it, it wasn't cheap, and it really just kind of put a damper on the day, but we made the best of, best of, of you know, going to the Eiffel Tower and enjoying Kings Island, and, and I just wasn't going to say one single word to my, my family, to my, my dad, who was home, because he was home at the time when we got back, and how'd things go? Oh, we had a great time. And about a week or so later, I come home, and my dad's there, and he's got an envelope in his hand, and he's like, hey, Mike, how you been driving lately? Oh, I've been driving pretty good. No, that's not what I mean. And he reaches in the envelope and pulls out my driver's license. How are you driving without your driver's license? Well, you know, that's an interesting story. And so, you know, I had to pay for it. Sherry helped me. She helped me pay for the, 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 the cost of the ticket. I got my license back. And, uh, you know, the law, the law tells us that, you know, tells us here's the speed limit. And, you know, you break the speed limit. You are going to face the consequences of the law. And I didn't have any. I, my dad didn't step up. He's like, you know what, son? I'm going to show you a little bit of grace. I'm going to pay that ticket for you. No, he wasn't going to do that. But with regards to your sin and my sin, we have committed the breach of the law against God. 
that the curse of the law, that is, the penalty of, of breaking the law, is death. For, for all sin, for any sin, whether you lie or cheat or steal or murder, that's the death penalty from Scripture. And Christ redeemed us from this curse. And how did He do it? He died. He died our death. And the wrath and the punishment that we deserve was poured out on Him. That's exactly what Isaiah 53 says. And many Jews to this day will skip that chapter. And what are they skipping? The wonderful words of life. Jesus alone provides what Moses, and that's what he says in verse 39, from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. In other words, there's no way we could be freed. All we could be was guilty. You broke the law. Here's the law. You went against it. Guilty. The law does not save you. It tells you you broke the law. It reveals your sinful condition. And Jesus alone provides what Moses in the law could not. Jesus was, he was contending with, with the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the, the religious leaders of his day. And he says in John chapter 5, this is how the Jews thought about the Scriptures. He says in verse 39, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. In other words, if I just keep the law, if I keep every law, I'm going to be fine. But nobody, not even the Jews, can keep the law. And the minute that you say, I'm going to keep the law. I mean, you immediately walk out, and before you know it, you've just broken a law. <laughs> you know, the, the thing is like, well, I'll never lie. And then you find yourself in a position, and you're like, oh, my goodness, I just lied about that. How easily we stumble. No, Jesus says you're not going to find eternal life by keeping the Scriptures. You're, you, you're not, we're not capable of doing that. We're breaking the law of the Scripture. He says that it is these scriptures that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. So by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in God's sight. Romans chapter 3.20 For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. When you see the law, and you're confronted with breaking the law. It just, it's just reminding you, I'm a sinner. In the context of God's Word. But the law of God that He calls the law of righteousness, the law of, of righteousness of God has been manifested. In other words, has come, has been revealed. And it was witnessed through the law and prophets. In other words, it was there all along. What was there all along? Jesus the Savior, the Messiah. They, know, they knew Him as the Messiah, the root of Jesse, the promised one of Jesse, of David. And we see that even the righteousness of God in Romans 3.22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who would believe, for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, whether you're a Jew or Gentile, male or female, rich or poor, all of us are in the same boat. We're sinners. And we've all fallen short of God's glory. But there's no distinction on the other side of it. That we are justified. In other words, that we are made right with God as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Jesus Christ. You, you just see it over and over and over. I could belabor the point more and more and more to say 
that what Paul is preaching in Acts chapter 13 is exactly what he says in Galatians, in Romans, in First and Second Timothy, in First and Second Thessalonians, in Colossians, in Ephesians, over and over again. He is revealing to us this Christ from the Old Testament scriptures, who is the only Savior, and He is the Savior of the condition that we all suffer from. And that is sin. And there's no, there is no eternity with God. There is no heaven with God apart from coming through Christ. That's it. And so that's where the warning and the the last two are just brief as we conclude here. He says there for them to take heed. In other words, you better be listening. You better got your ears on. How many times did I hear my father tell me coming out? It's like, you boys got your ears on, right? It's like, I'm like going to the mirror. It's like, I thought I had my ears on. Yeah, they're they're on, Dad. But he knew. He knew my ears are right here, but sometimes I wasn't focused. I wasn't giving him my attention. Therefore, take heed. You need to give your full and undivided attention to what I have just shared. Why? So that the things spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. And this was a problem with Israel over and over again. Because they heard these words and they did not heed them. And even in the days of Christ, he was giving them these words and they did not heed them. Matter of fact, what did they do? Just the opposite. They would put him to death. They waited for their Messiah to come. He came. The Messiah came. And they rejected him. Jesus came to his own, but his own did not receive him. That is, he came to the Jews. And he was performing signs and wonders to reveal that, yes, He was the Son of God, that He was the Christ. And yet, many did not believe. Matter of fact, by the time we get you know, to thousands upon thousands of people Jesus preached to and taught and healed and all those kinds of things, by the time we get to His 33rd year of life, they crucify Him. And by the time we get to the upper room in Acts chapter 1, where his disciples are gathered together, there's only about 120 of them. Out of three years of earthly ministry, only 120 disciples out of thousands that heard the word. They rejected him. And this is the warning. Paul's hearers are not only including the Jews. Like, well, I'm glad I'm not a Jew. No, he's, this, this is whoever hears these words, and we're hearing these words here this morning, we need to watch carefully. We need to pay attention lest we fall into the judgments, the, the judgment as the prophet warned. Well, you know, what is this judgment? Well, he says it in verse 41, and this comes from Habakkuk. Behold, you scoffers. Somebody who is a scoffer is like, they are rejecting. And oftentimes they're doing it in a a very negative way. You scoffers and marvel and perish. Behold, you, you scoffers and marvel and perish. Marvel is not like, oh, that's great. No, no, no. Marvel is 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 to be amazed in such a way it's it is treachery. That you are so stunned. It's like what we see unfolding. In, in Maui, these people jumping in the ocean, it is, we marvel at it, but not from the standpoint of like, that's great. It's terrifying. He's what he's saying here. And he goes on to say, for I am accomplishing a work in your days. In other words, I am going to do a work, and this, this is not going to be a work of salvation. This is not going to be a work of redemption. No, it's because he had already done that with them, and they had rejected that, he is now going to do a work of judgment. He's going to do something that Israel never dreamed would ever happen in their lives, and that is that another nation would come in and take over. And that's what happened. The Babylonians 
were dispatched by God's providence to come in and judge the nation of Israel and take them into captivity, to, to, to go to Judah and to carry off. This is just unthinkable. And the temple would be destroyed and the wall would be destroyed in Jerusalem and all the things that you, 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 you just can't do that. You know, this is the, the God of Israel will not allow that to happen. And yet this is the judgment of God's people. And it was a, a work of judgment, even though they were told they weren't, they weren't going to believe. And you know, we are much like that. That when we were told, well, if you do this, this is going to be the consequence. And in your mind, it's like, yeah, that's never going to happen. And then it is consequence. You, you do it and you receive the consequence. Like many people, we learn the hard way. Like Israel. And it says here that, that they won't believe even though God's prophet or a preacher like Paul declares it to them. In other words, he warns them ahead of time. You have an opportunity to turn back to the Lord, and this is not going to happen, but they're not going to believe. He gives them an opportunity. That is the grace of God. I, I love how John MacArthur clarifies here. He says, those words were spoken about God's judgment that was coming on Judah. God was going to use the wicked Chaldeans, that, the, the Babylonians, as his instruments to bring severe judgment on wicked Ju Judah. Paul used it to illustrate the destruction of the, that the Old Testament pledges uh, to sinners who refuse to repent and submit to the Lord. The choice with which Paul left his audience is the choice every person faces. You and me face this choice. Accepting the salvation offered in Jesus Christ, bringing forgiveness of sins and eternal, eternal life, or rejecting it brings judgment and eternal damnation. God's grace and love do not cancel His justice and holy hatred of sin. So we either turn to God and receive the free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ and eternity with Him, or we reject Him. And if you note the descriptions that Jesus um, uses in, to, to describe those who reject and those who believe, He says, narrow is the road or the path that leads to life because few find it and walk. But wide is the road of destruction that leads to eternal destruction. So here's the grace of God. He leaves them. He doesn't, he doesn't try to make this happen. He doesn't try to seal the deal as some would try to do in our day. To make people's like, you know, just try to manipulate people into making, well, yeah, I want to make that decision. Now, what God does is He makes you alive together with Christ. By His Spirit, we call it new birth. He makes you alive together with Christ. And by His grace and His grace only are we saved. And so as Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging. And that's, that's what's interesting, that they wanted to hear more. That's a good sign. Please, please, come next Sabbath and keep teaching on this. That's great. But while Luke records great interest in hearing from Paul and Barnabas about these things, for the next Sabbath. Please come next Sabbath. Let's hear this again. There were many that were remaining uncommitted. Again, MacArthur notes here, for a preacher to so fascinate his hearers that they demand to hear him again is a testimony to the effectiveness of his preaching. For them to delay a conclusion about Jesus Christ, however, is dangerous. To the Corinthians, Paul wrote, for he says, at the acceptable time I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. In other words, Paul, he, he, is, he is telling, um, you know, these people um, and telling the Corinthians and telling us, don't delay. Don't wait. When is the time of salvation? Right now. 
Today is the day of salvation. And it says here in verse 43 that there were many Jews and God-fearing proselytes, proselytes who followed Paul and Barnabas. And they were talking to them. You know, when the, the meeting broke up and people were leaving, most people were dispersing, but there were some that followed Paul and Barnabas. And so Paul and Barnabas continued to speak with them. And it says there in verse 43, that they were urging them to continue in the grace of God. That is the glimpse that we have, potentially, that some of these were believers because he mentions the grace of God. The only way you could continue in the grace of God is that you have received the grace of God, that you have believed and walked in the grace of God. So Paul has revealed from the Old Testament Scriptures that Jesus is undeniably the Savior. He is the Savior of all who would believe, both Jew and Gentile. He is the one whom God promised the gift of salvation to everyone who believes. The question this morning is, do you believe? Do you believe? And I say you because it's not in us. You are probably here this morning and you do believe. So we could throw that together in an us. But you may be here today and you have yet to believe. Truly believe. And what's happened this morning is God is confronting each one of us, each individual, with these wonderful words of life from God's holy word. God is declaring to you this very moment that through him, that is Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And I thought it'd be fitting that we would end where we began our time together in the baptismal waters, Romans 10, 8. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. And that's what I preach to you this morning, brothers and sisters. I have preached to you the word of faith, the word of life. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with, a heart, with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the Scripture says, whoever believes in Him will not be disappointed. I can tell you, personally, I have never been disappointed. Not with Christ. Even in my worst moments, even with being diagnosed with cancer, I was not disappointed. It was a moment that drove me to my knees to pray to Christ and to pray for His will. In fact, again, this, this week, uh, this was my 18th month blood work. It came back again clear of cancer. Praise the Lord. But that the fact that 18 months later, I could be still standing in this pulpit to be with you all today, to preach this word today, I am not disappointed. And I would not be disappointed if the Lord said, come home today, Mike. You know, whether to be here to preach and to continue, as Paul says, or to be with the Lord, that's a hard thing, you know. But either way, it's a win. It's a win-win in Christ. For the Scriptures say, whoever believes in Him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on Him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Oh, Lord, thank you for the gift of this gospel. Thank you for the promise of salvation through Jesus Christ. Thank you that on this day we have gathered in this place to hear the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ proclaimed. And thank you, Lord, for placing this invitation before us. For some, it is just a continued encouragement of that we are continuing our walk in the grace of God. For others, it can be a return to a faith that they once walked away from. They had fallen away. Or, or for the very first time, their eyes are open. Their heart is open to receive Christ. 
may not be in this room. It may be somebody that hears this message online somewhere down the road. We just pray, Father God, that, that your word does not return void, but you will accomplish exactly what you intend to accomplish with it. Most importantly, that people are saved and believe in you. We love you, Lord. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.